So Nick just got done smashing a fly. Nick smash. I destroy his face. Yes, and everything and else. Everything about else him. attached. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's what I was gonna say. So, all right. A while back, myself, Nick, or myself, Micah, and several others uh, reacted to. Uh, I don't think you were here for uh, when we did Batman v Superman. I don't think so. Yeah, Maybe well, I've been. That maybe I, I know forget. I've told you guys at least on one or two videos before that Batman vs Superman is the only movie that I've ever fallen asleep in a theater at. <laughs> so. There you go. That's not a testament to how bad that film is. Mm -hmm. I don't know what is. So I saw it with my buddy, and like I was like, just like so boring. At some point, he had to be like, I'm like, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> See, I've I've fallen asleep during certain films when I was a kid. I, uh, I loved Star Wars as a kid. I loved it. But we had a long trip, and my parents were just like, you want to watch You want to watch a Star Wars movie? And I'm like, yeah. So they put on A New Hope, and then all of a sudden, I'm like... Huh. <laughs> and it was, the, uh, it was the Death Star battle, right? And I was like, I yeah. was like, oh. I missed it all. Yeah. And my parents were just like... Did you enjoy your nap? I'm like, why didn't you wake me up with Star Wars? <laughs> and they're like, they're like, we're sorry, honey. We just thought you should get some rest. I'm like, oh. <laughs> we drove up to Washington D.C. to visit and everything. We stayed at my uncle Michael's house. Yeah, I've fallen asleep during like a lot of other movies at like my friends' houses and my house and stuff. But like the only one I ever fell asleep theater. in a the theater was Batman vs Superman. Yeah. Damn. And Man of Steel, uh, a lot of people have been actually requesting that, that we watch this review specifically. And my thing, my, my thing about this film is that when I first saw it, I was a little middle of the road about it. I thought it was, you know, not the best thing. Definitely not the worst thing I'd ever seen. I mean, it's no Howard the Duck in terms of its, like, shittiness. Uh, but this is actually, after some consideration... This, to me, is actually a decent comic book film that is just muddled with with just bad storytelling mistakes, in my opinion. I remember it came out on DVD while I was working at FYE, for sure. Mm -hmm. And there was several different people that told me they liked it a lot. Well, But my thing is just, I've always been really mad about Superman, so I just never had enough interest to watch it. Well, okay, I have I had interest in Superman as a kid. As I've gotten older, I've found other heroes that, honestly, I relate more with and I find more interesting. That being said, um, for me, the one thing about the casting in this film was that the casting was about pitch perfect. Because Kevin Costner as Jonathan Kent... To me, that was just like, that's perfect. That's just like, down home, all-American dad, you know, showing his son the ropes and how to and how to be a good person. That's a, that, like, he's a great example of that. And then Diane Lane as well. Also a really good casting choice to play Martha. Why did you say that name? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Was there a live-action Superman show at some point? Uh, there was, a long, long time ago. because yeah, I'm pretty sure I saw there was some Smallville. episodes of that on TV. And then when there was Smallville. Yeah, not Smallville, but like before Smallville was a thing. There was a black and white version. Yeah, like, I, that's the only Superman I really got exposed to, really, as a kid. And, like, I thought it was okay at that point, but... I remember when that appeared the on The Batman Nick animated Night. series was where I watched a lot of it as a kid, and I always loved Batman. Well, yeah, the animated series Superman I thought was actually pretty interesting. There were some good stories in it, although still vastly super, so I vastly preferred uh, Batman. Yeah. To to Superman, that's just that's just how it's always just been. Just as I grew up, I always preferred Batman way more. Yeah, same here, same here. So anyway, we have the uh, we have Man of Steel queued up here by uh, the Nostalgia Critic, the review that he did. With Angry Joe, I guess there was an animated Superman I watched at some point because that's how I kind of knew about like well, I know there was Lex also Luthor the and Superman... Kryptonite and stuff because I never yeah. really touched on that in the live action episodes that I saw. Well, there was always <clears throat> there were these animated serials that happened way back in the day, and uh, I remember the the th I still remember the theme. Dun 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 that's the, that was the Superman theme from like back in like the forties. Yeah, it doesn't really ring a bell to me. And it was, 
It was and uh, it was actually pretty good, but you know, as time goes on, you find other things that interest you, and <clears throat> well, we got this cute. And plus, I know you're a big fan of Angry Joe, the angriest of of Joes. Well, I'm a fan of Angry Joe. I wouldn't say like a big fan because like occasionally I'll have some like straight up like I don't agree with you at all Joe moments. But I've had those too. It's like for the most part, it's like I left like several movies being like this movie was so stupid and I'll go watch his review and he'll say the same things I was thinking about it and then vice versa on video games you know and stuff I'll be like this game's fucking awesome and he's like it gets my badass seal of approval you know and stuff yeah. like that and I'm just like yeah he likes a lot of the same stuff and hates a lot of the same stuff I do so but every it's now enough and for again, me to get behind him but every now and again he 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 you done fucked it up yeah like but also every now and again he'll just say something about something and I'll be like I can't really get behind you on that one. Yeah, I've had those moments. But I've had also, those moments. I've had those moments with Doug. Uh, yeah. There's been moments where I've just been like, "Wait, you think that Return to Oz is actually a good film?" And me, Return to Oz is not a good film. But yeah. Doug uh, cites it as one of his favorite fantasy films. You see, it, it's also like Moulin Rouge to him. Moulin Rouge is a guilty pleasure. Whereas me, I'm just I'm more along the lines of just like. It's got some interesting stuff, but overall, it's not. It's it's a jukebox musical. That's really it. But yeah, you know, there's some p- parts of the film that are actually really well done. But well, Joe's also a fellow metalhead, so oh well, yeah, I mean, too. there you go. I mean, just <clears throat> yeah, throw up the horns. So we have the episode queued up here. Let's see what they got to say. It's actually. You, Zack Snyder. Is that your video game nerd? 
Yep. Oh, so. Him in the in, in the beginning of Doug's career, him and the ABGN had a little bit of a quote unquote rivalry where they fought like they fought three times and uh, it, it actually was very entertaining all three times. <clears throat> nice Dutch angle. Superman critic, he's obviously not the one we grew up with. Yeah, that one made sense. What, time traveling? Flying around the world? Mostly made sense. You just can't accept <laughs> the fact that this is something new. And while we all know that the first two films are legendary, yeah. it's time for a different way of looking at this story. Pause one second. Told about I was just talking to someone about a comment on the Game of Thrones video, and they were saying, Angry Joe, it's in his name. Everyone expects him to hate everything. And it's like, he's literally playing the side of, like, for this movie in this video. Yeah, there's some some things he will always stand up for, Superman being one of them, because yeah. he loves Superman. He loves the he loves the Superman character. But it just kind of proves the point that he, he doesn't always hate everything. If you give him a chance, there's stuff he likes. So. There you go thousand times the same way. Okay, look, I'm sick to death of that bullshit argument, so I'll tell you what. I am willing to look at this in a new light because, hey, we should be willing to accept things from a new point of view. I will still try my best to accept this as its own unique thing without drawing any references from the original movies. Thank you. Deal? Deal. But you have to acknowledge that when a moment sucks, it fucking sucks. No matter how much testosterone-filled bullshit is in it. I make no promises. Joe! <laughs> Alright, fine. <sighs> well, let's look at the movie that has the internet totally split down the middle. This is either the absolutely loved or absolutely hated Man of Steel. We start off with the birth of our hero on planet every sci-fi movie ever made. And seeing how this is a Zack Snyder yeah. film, everything obviously either looks like H.R. Geiger's hand-me-downs or penises. Look at these things! Tell me that doesn't look like the Little Mermaid poster! I actually quite like the new Krypton look. Sci-fi, medieval mesh, interesting wildlife, but I suppose the floating robots do look a bit like the hairdo in The Last Airbender. Oh, no, no, no. We have interpretations of that in barbed wire. As our high council is wearing what I assume is Krypton's version of mini roller coasters. <laughs> <laughs> Are you seriously suggesting that we evacuate the entire planet? No. Everybody here is already dead. A lot of you know the drill here. Superman's father, Jor-El, played by Russell Crowe, is trying to convince the higher-ups that the planet Krypton is about to explode and nobody believes him. But hell, the entire world blowing up isn't exciting enough. Let's throw in a hostile takeover while we're at it, too. This particular hostile takeover is led by General Zod, played by Michael. Why does everyone say I lisp like Willem Dafoe Shannon? These lawmakers, with their endless debates, have led Krypton to ruin. Help me save our race, the degenerative bloodlines that led us to this state. And who will decide which bloodline survives on? You? I humbly accept your nomination. Don't do this, hell. So, seeing how Zod's army fought off this world's equivalent of White House security so easily, it only makes sense that jor should be able to fight off Zod's army that broke through this world's equivalent of White House security so easily. I think. He yeah. rides on his dragonfly... dragon, picks up yet another subplot, because Lord knows we don't have enough of those going on in this opening, and plans to put it in a space pod, sending his son to Earth, who will be the only survivor. Goodbye, my son. Nah, shoot, we gotta have that pesky emotion. Come on, this is a Christopher Nolan story. You can throw in more subplots. At least strap that baby to a bomb or something. He rises from the dentist's chair and is sent out towards Earth, just before Zod's forces arrive. 
Concentrate fire on the main door. Yes, person who clearly has no microphone attached to his mouth. What have you done? We've had a child's on. Harris, destroy it! He stuff a bag of marshmallows in his mouth before talking? Harris, destroy it! Harris, destroy it! Actually, the funny thing about Michael Shannon's performance is how he manages to be both over-the-top extreme and under-the-bottom restrained. It's kind of like watching Jerry Lewis act. He may start off low and appear not to be very interested, but then, in a millisecond, he can change into a hey with the screaming and the yelling and the nice lady! Oh, shut up. He did great. Michael Shannon is a damn good actor. He was portrayed he an act, a good bitter, but... single-minded man who has nothing to lose as he's pushed to the breaking point. Yeah, but does his breaking point have to sound like a bulldog? You won't kill us yourself! You wouldn't throw in your hands, but you'll ram us through a hot door. Yeah, well, at least he doesn't sound like a screaming goat when he yells. Hey, I do not! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> gets the best of him just before security gets the best of Zod. This calls for a Hans Zimmer Blaum. Is anyone else sick of that sound yet? I swear, if Hans Zimmer did the music to your good man Charlie Brown, it'd be your good man Charlie. Wow. <laughs> so Zod is sentenced to imprisonment in the Phantom Zone. You believe your son is safe? I will find him. Sorry, didn't quite catch that. I will find him. No, still didn't get it. I will find him. Mm, still not coming through. Tell you what, say it as loud and ridiculously hammy as your cartoonishly large eyes and mouth will allow. I will find him! Now I hear ya. No, you won't. Bye. I swear to God, look at it! Look at it! Those are penises. Those, those are some so they wait for the inevitable, as it's the end of the world as they know it, and everyone feels blandly fine. Lady Lauren, shouldn't you find refuge? What? I can't hear you over the incredibly quiet destruction of the world. There is no refuge, Kido. So Kal-El travels to the planet known as Earth, where he lands on an episode of Deadliest Catch. Okay, we may have skipped forward a touch, but at least now we have time to give Clark, played by Henry Cavill, some proper development for his character. Or just blow shit up again, because the past 20 minutes clearly haven't shown enough of that. I am Leonidas Wolverine Brawny Man. Follow my non-flammable pants to freedom. When Kansas became a territory. Oh, we're in this kind of story. What kind of story? The out of order story that got critical acclaim with Memento, so Nolan's been trying to use it with every film he's been attached to. He's a boy, he's a man, he's a teenager, he's a boy again, he's a man. And it wouldn't be so bad if he would at least talk about what he's going through, but he never does. Wait, aren't you the one saying that Nolan films already have too much dialogue already? Well, kind of, sort of, maybe. It depends on how you use it. I mean, if it's need to use it, if it's not, don't. Well, you actually don't need it here. Scenes like Clark as a boy getting used to his powers are already emotional scenes. You don't have to explain them. Now that's true. Scenes like this are good on their own, but we're getting background on a guy whose personality we're never given time to know. Look at this. Mm. We have a flashback to his childhood and then we cut back to present time. Then literally one minute later, we get another flashback to his childhood. Welcome back, missed ya. They never give any time to understand this guy. I've got to know the personality of my minute rise more than I have this person. So what's wrong with that? Lots of us constantly get flashbacks out of nowhere about the troubling childhood. Joe. Joe. <laughs> what's that, Papa? <laughs> no, I don't want to wear the big lobster costume. Why do you make me wear that anyways? No, Papa, no, not the nipple tasers, please. I think the less I know about this, the better. <laughs> So after yeah. countless moments of intense scenes and harsh action, what is this flashback gonna show? Some intense scenes and harsh action. Oh, my rib. Wow, this film's running the gamut of all two things that can be done with a movie. So young Clark saves the bus of kids, which leads to the dismay of his father, John Kent. 
played by that voice box that sounds like Kevin Costner. Or maybe it's just Kevin Costner. They're pretty easy to mix up. We talked about this. You have... Oh, Clark, you have to keep this side of yourself a secret. And this, of course, gives way to one of the most controversial parts mm, of the movie. Yes. John Ken saying he should have let the kids on the bus die. What was I supposed to do? Just let them die? Maybe. Uh, yeah. What do you got to say about that, Joe? Joe? No, but for nothing, that Joe Glycerin! Joe! Oh. Sorry. The scene where John Ken says, drown the bastards. Hey, hey, he doesn't say let them die. He says, maybe let them die. That's much better. Well, it's his way of saying he doesn't know. And that's what's so great about it, because it mimics real life far more than previous Superman films. It shows that people don't always have the answers. All he knows is that he doesn't want his son to be discovered and hurt. But he never says, let them die. He says, he doesn't know. Okay, fine. Tough, confusing world. Why can't Superman's father then talk to him like a father? What do you mean? He is the one that builds him up. And that's it. Every line in this movie is just talking about what a messiah he is. You were sent here for a reason. When the world finds out what you can do, it's going to change everything. You're not just anyone, Clark. You're the answer to are we alone in the universe. Stand proud in front of the human race. He's less of a tough father and more like a stereotypical Jewish mother. Oh, Oy you man. gotta see my son. When the world finds out what he can do, it's gonna change everything. Thank he you, was man. sent here for a reason. He's the answer to are we alone in the universe. Ma'am, 911 is for emergencies only. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I could have had a busload of drowned kids for you, but my son saved them too. But don't worry, I punished him properly for that. Ma'am, never pick up the phone again. Why does everyone keep telling me that? Come on, those are some strong, well-written words. It's every Boing Destiny monologue we've heard before. Oh yeah? Prove it. People are afraid of what they don't understand. You always fear what you don't understand. People fear what they don't understand. People fear what they do not understand. People are frightened by what they don't understand. He, he said it differently, though. Yeah. <laughs> we found you in this. This was in the chamber with you. I took it to a metallurgist at Kansas State. He said whatever it was made from didn't even exist on the periodic table. That's another way of saying that it's not from this world, Clark. They surprisingly asked no questions and let me take my miracle stone home without ever calling anybody. See, they knew how to keep a secret. And it turns out years later, Clark does a good job carrying that secret. Like when a bully inflicts no physical harm on him whatsoever, so he crucifies his truck, costing <laughs> God knows how much money in damages. But at least he didn't save anybody. So, seeing how we're watching Clark go on this long journey, are we finally gonna get some idea of what his personality is like? Yeah, you all know the answer to this. Hello, other characters and subplots! One of them being Lois Lane, played by Amy Adams, doing a report on some sort of disturbance. Oh, hell no, you cannot badmouth Lois Lane. She is a stronger character, a more confident one. Mm. She's a risk taker. She doesn't have time for the military's pissing contest. She actually does something in this film. And she's not always screaming for someone to save her. Yeah, that is until she's hit by the Nolan Ray. The what? The Nolan Ray. You see, I have no doubt that Zack Snyder started off having Lois as an interesting, funny, opinionated character. Because at first, she does seem that way. Yeah. We're done measuring dicks. Can you have your people show me what you found? But then she's zapped by the Nolan Ray, and suddenly every line of dialogue is emphasizing the weight of how important the movie you're watching is. Remember when his father was bawling him out like a real father? Right, we talked about this, you have- Boom! Nolan Ray! You're the answer to are we alone in the universe. Remember how Lois Lane was feisty and took no nonsense from anybody? Well, what can I say? I get writer's block if I'm not wearing a black jacket. Boom! Nolan Ray! The questions raised by my rescuer's existence are frightening to contemplate. Even Barry White, played by Lawrence Fishburne. He starts off in your face screaming about stories and deadlines. You let Woodburn just shotgun it all over the internet. No, let's make it three weeks since you're so willing to agree with me. No, oh, that's way too interesting. Little bit of the Nolan Ray will fix that. Can you imagine how people on this planet would react if they knew there was someone like this out there? The Nolan Ray, because whatever important issue you're talking about, it can always be more important. Critic, you know, sometimes life is like that. 
Life can be tough. Life can be cruel. Life can throw lobster costumes and nipple tasers into your reality. Am I ever oh. gonna know the story to that? <laughs> the less you know, the better. Fair enough. <laughs> so Lois follows a certain laser-eyeing someone into the ice where she discovers a spaceship. A spaceship that apparently saw her performance in Julie and Julia. Oh! But Clark is there to take down the machine, heal her wounds, and... apparently leave her for dead. When she observes that Clark has taken the spaceship away, she tries to write a report on it, only to find her boss won't run it. So she lets it leak to the internet. My editor won't print it, but if it happened to leak online... But didn't you once describe my site as a creeping cancer of falsehoods? Hey, look, it's TMZ. <laughs> that was a good one. That was a good joke, yeah. They're the scum of the earth. Yes, they are. So dude. Clark loads the yes, exposition program and... Matter of fact, you know what? I'm going to rant on TMZ a little bit. <laughs> okay. Those assholes jumped the gun and said Ric Flair was in a life-threatening situation. Turns out, no, it was just a scheduled surgery uh, for, a little correct, uh, for a little correction. That's all. Instead, TMZ jumps the gun and says, Oh yeah, Ric Flair, he's going to die. Uh, make sure to you know send all your thoughts and prayers out there. Oh wait, no, no, he's he's just fine. He's fine. TMZ. God, I I think Har I think I forget who said that. I, I actually I think you were the one who showed me the the comedian saying it. I think that the reason why the Holocaust was so bad was because they were trying to kill the ancestors of Harvey Lavin so he would never be born. Yeah, it wasn't me who showed you that. Uh, I forget who showed <laughs> It's like, that's why the Holocaust was so bad. They were searching for the ancestors of Harvey Lavin because I guess I guess Hitler went to the future, saw how bad TMZ was, and said, Ach, nein! Must not be ever, we must not allow this to happen. <laughs> and then he came back, and then all of a sudden he was just like, All right, where is the Lavin family? Hmm? Hmm? Too many Lavins. Hmm. Now that I think about it, too many Jews. Let's take care of that. Sorry. Yeah, that's how that happened. <laughs> oh, God. I forget it's who... It's been fucked up history with Nathaniel. Eh. Uh, you want fucked up history? Watch Oversimplified. That's some fucked up history. Yeah. There's some pretty awesome effects. A computer with what's left of Jarrell explains Krypton's history. I am your father, Cal. That's my name. And I'm Javier! Our race spread out through the stars. The scout ship was one of thousands launched into the void. We sent thousands of these scout ships, and yet our backup plan, in case the world blows up, was a little baby-sized pod. You can see why we didn't last very long. Artificial population control was established. So it's explained that Clark is Krypton's first natural birth in centuries. Not exactly sure how they control that, or whether everyone just kept to the honor system, or if they genetically altered babies to be born with chastity belts, but regardless, Clark has apparently broken the chain. And he now knows it's his job to do what he can for all mankind. So he practices flying around the mountainside, while the cameraman practices keeping his finger off the goddamn zoom button. Yeah, you may notice very quickly, there's a lot of this in this movie. Yes, there For is. For no reason at all, Too whenever there's fast-paced motion, the camera has to zoom in on it like a monkey with a fucking camcorder. How do you think the cinematographer came across that ingenious move? No, come on, honey, give Daddy the camera. No, no, I have to show Mr. Snyder my test footage for Man of Steel tomorrow. Please, no, no, come on, honey. I can explain. Oh, I love this. I knew you would. <laughs> of course. So Lois goes searching for her rescuer slash lever of people to die in the snow, and through asking questions and listening to hearsay, she locates exactly where he is. Of course, this calls for celebrating with another flashback. I'm tired of safe. I just want to do something useful with my life. So farming, feeding people. That's I mention the camera in this movie has been shaky as fuck this whole time. Yes, it has. Wait a minute, Papa Kent. Did you just in a few flashbacks say that he was destined to change the world when people discovered him? Yeah, somebody was like we'll fucking out what you can just do. Record it on the camcorder. Everything. And now you're saying you never uh, wanted to be discovered and you just use want him to be a, a farmer? Stand. I'm starting to think Clark yeah. has three fathers: Jarrell, John, and John's other friggin' personality. But get ready for a big shock here. Something big and terrible tries to kill them, and thus they all try to seek shelter. Hey, get in the car. Hey, get in the car. I'll get him. I'll get him. No, no. 
Get you long to the overpass. But wait a minute. Hey! Hey! What about Boomer? Boomer would be saved by John even though it would have been a lot easier if he just sent Clark in to go get him, causing John to hurt his leg, unable to make it back in time. But he stops Clark from saving him because he's an attention-hungry martyr who doesn't want Clark to be outed even though he's gonna be outed just a few years later anyway. Ah! Wait, what? Yeah. Yep, even though there's about a million other ways this problem could have been solved, John Kent sacrifices himself because he stands by how Clark should change the world by never doing a goddamn thing. Uh... He's just doing what he thinks is right. But it's not right! But he thinks it's right! Does that make it right? Does that make it not right? Not right? 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 Right! Right! No! What the hell did we just agree on? You see, this movie's deeper than you think. It's raising questions. Oh, shut up. <laughs> no, it's not. While we're at it, why does everyone in this movie take death like a light breeze? All of the people who die in this film never mention, flinch, move, or even what? make a noise. What? If you just saw, like, even if someone saw him, like, fly in there and save him and the dog, right? Like, yeah. It's during a tornado. Like... One of the few times ever that you might see someone flying and just be like, oh, well, I guess the tornado, <laughs> you know, and just kind of ignore yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> know what I mean? It's a believable thing. I thought I, I didn't think about that. But honestly, at that point, I think right there, this is my biggest diversion. With this, I know you're going to be pissed off about us pausing the video. I'm sorry, okay? <laughs> I have to say this. Well, people get pissed off when we talk over it, so oh, take a pic. Oh, yeah. There you go. So here's my biggest nitpick about this scene right here. And yeah, I know that this is me going back to the original ser the original trilogy, but hear me out. Or the original Superman movies, hear me out. The biggest thing about this versus John, Jonathan Kent's death in the original films, this was something that Clark could have done something about. 100%. This is something that, that Superman could have saved his father from. In the original, it was a heart attack. And the reason why that is much more poetic is because it is something Superman... Despite, in spite of all of his strengths, all of his advantages, Could would be absolutely powerless to stop. Yeah. And there wouldn't be a damn thing he could do about it. Whereas in this, I think this would have been a good opportunity for Clark to choose. And this would have been the moment where Clark chose that he actually wanted to help people. And he went and he did it anyway. In spite of his father's protests. And then that's what caused him to leave. What caused him to leave would be pretty much the disowning of his father. And then Clark would come back later and would find out that Jonathan died. Yeah. Of something. Cancer. Whatever. You know, insert, insert ailment here that causes character to die. That, to me, would have been a lot more poetic and would have said a lot more than just Jonathan Kent standing there all stoic and just like his hand out like, no son, not this way. And plus, he's in the middle of a tornado, I'm sorry, but if you're in the middle of a tornado and you're not screaming, something's wrong. My mom's been in a tornado. <laughs> we were almost in a tornado last weekend oh yeah yeah when you went to that uh, <laughs> festival that almost got that, that got canceled yeah we saw some swirly clouds so eh, it's okay it's a little creepy i've seen those i've i we actually had a tornado touchdown about a few miles away from my home uh when i used to live in abingdon um actually killed seven people man damn yeah it it was a category three an F3, so it was pretty. It was a pretty heavy-duty one. Anyway, let's get back to it. That's my big gripe about this one scene. And these deaths have ranged from stabbing, explosion, and tornado. I think somebody in that lineup would at least go, ow! Maybe. Or holy shit! Well, the movie's tired of waiting for Clark to actually do anything, so General Zod appears on the Monarch ship to threaten the world to hand him over. 
think whoever's at the helm of that thing is looking to make a dramatic entrance. Thanks for the arrow, by the way. We never will have known what we were supposed to look at. Oh. You are not a star, no. My name is General Zod. I come from a world far from you. So it looks like their ability to take over all of Earth's video footage understandably gives a barely visible picture. But for some reason, that sound sure seems crystal clear. To Kal-El, I say this. Surrender within 24 hours. And tell Nash thanks for the microphone. It works great. No problem, tyrannical overlord! Watch this world suffer the consequences. Consequences. This is Orson Welles, ladies and gentlemen, to assure you that the War of the Worlds has no further significance than as the holiday offering it was intended to be. So Clark tries to figure out what to do and seeks the advice of both his mother and possibly a higher source. God? What is that? I don't know where to start. Whatever you want. I, I can't make that out. What is that? Do you know why they want you? No. It's the symbolism. So Clark reveals himself Such and surrenders symbolism. to the military, <laughs> who have also brought in Lois, seeing how she's the only one who knew anything about his existence. What's the S stand for? It's not an S. On my world, it means hope. Well, well, here it's an ass. Oh, I could look at your ass all day. Really? Hey, you've done worse. I ass titties. I ass I ass and titties. I ass titties. I ass I ass. So he convinces humanity that he's not a threat, and that he's going to hand himself over to Zod. Humanity goes okay, okay. and lets him turn himself in to Zod's second in command, Feora. But she also seems to want Lois to go with two. General Zod would like this woman to accompany me. Why? Sorry. I'll go. We also got what? Julie and Julia on planet Krypton. You will pay for costing Meryl Streep an Oscar. As if she doesn't have enough. Shut up. So they go aboard Zod's ship, but Clark has a What's hard time What's she gonna do, use it for a paperweight? Atmosphere. What's happening to him? He's rejecting our ship's Whoa. atmospherics. Hello, Cal. Welcome to my weird mental thingy. I and my fellow officers was sentenced to the Phantom Zone. So Zod explains how they were freed once Krypton was destroyed and how they got the ship working to travel to Earth to find him. I will find yes, we him! Yeah, that did it. He explains that the Codex for all living things on Krypton is in his possession, and so he has the power to make Krypton live again. If Krypton lives again, what happens to Earth? The foundation has to be built on something. You know, is it really wise to tell your only hope for the future of your race that you're going to destroy his place that he calls home? Wouldn't that kind of make him resistant and thus make things go a little slower? Maybe this wasn't what he was supposed to see. Maybe they accidentally put in the wrong program to show him. If I give you the Codex, what happens to Earth? Uh, the foundation has to be built on something. No, 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 no! No, no, skulls! Skulls everywhere! Who does that? You can't, this isn't going to make him happy. It'll turn you into a raving psychotic! Run the happy program, the happy program! Ah, uh, see? Much better. Look, we've got dancing bunnies here, and oh, look at the flowers all smiling. And, oh, there's even a unicorn riding a marshmallow rainbow. Isn't that adorable? Disturbing. You'll stay here until we remember the incredibly important reason we brought you on board. Does anyone remember why we brought her on board? This gives her a chance to use Jarrell in a box as they plan what I have to admit is a pretty awesome escape. Thanks to you, I'm uploading into the ship's mainframe. To your right, fire. Behind you. Oh my god, I want this guy as an AI on my next first person shooter game. <laughs> Secure yourself inside the open pod. Safe travels, Miss Lane. 
<laughs> this also allows Clark to escape as he's set to go down to Earth and stop them from harming anybody. We wanted you to learn what it meant to be human first. So that one day, when the time was right, Choose. you could be the bridge between two peoples. You can save all of them. But my father said never to be noticed or help people. Your father's a twat who directed the postman. You? Now go. I am Jesus! Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty <laughs> obvious. <laughs> hey, what's wrong with a little savior symbolism here or there? Here or there? I don't think the Bible has as much Jesus imagery. Okay, okay, but what would someone who's half immortal and half human be like? Would he be more human or would he be more godlike? Yes, he floats away on a cross, but but to me, they're just trying to have him move graceful in space, okay? They're not literally saying he's Jesus or God. And the church scene supports that he's humble. He's more human than we know. He needs the advice of others to help him make the right decisions. And this is when he truly comes over to our side, becomes one of us. You know what? Forget it. Let's just say you win. Really? Yeah, I'll claim it's Citizen Kane as long as I don't want to watch any more of this dark unpleasantness. they will probably please happy angry fanboys too. All right, score one for Angry Joe. I'm gonna convince you yet. The hell? You know, how come my show is so easy to hack? We are wrong. I come from a world far from you. I've traveled over the ocean of stars to reach... Oh, hold on a second. <laughs> Why the hell do we still have dial-up? This is General Zod. I've been watching your little review and I'm displeased to discover that you're giving it a positive rating. Yeah, he loves it now. It's like one of his favorite movies. Shut up, Joe. Perhaps you're unaware of how many people watch you, Nostalgia Critic, and how much I personally despise the film you are currently reviewing, and how easy it would be for me to rearrange your testicles so that they look like Jackson Pollock droppings. Whoa, that joke's on you, Zod. Once the critic makes up his mind, nothing changes it. Joe. You can literally rip his intestines out with an onion peeler. Joe. Or you can Joe. suck out his eyes with a vacuum hose. Joe. Or you can put him in a lobster costume and, and hang him upside down over a pit of ferrets injected with venom. Joe! Surprisingly, this isn't helping. Look, Zod. Hold on, I'm writing that last one down. Zod, the review isn't done yet. <laughs> and I'm gonna watch it all the way through. <laughs> Very good. And if you don't hate it, I will make sure that the corpse they find of you they will never recognize as a corpse. Hey, that's not fair. Critic, if you go back on your opinion, you're gonna have the whole of the internet hounding you down like an animal. Can't we all just hate Superman 4? <laughs> Everybody already does hate Superman 4, dude. Some people are calling him now, Superman, gets Lois out of the escape pod before it explodes. Aw, oh, what a charming romantic mu- Ah, oh, no time for that here. We got exposition to spew. I didn't want to tell them anything about you, but they did something to me. They looked inside my mind. It's okay, Lois. They did the same thing to me. Huh. Guess they forgot to show that scene. Kind of pointless, seeing how they could get the exact same information out of him. Hell, maybe Zod managed to find the correct imagery this time. You see, Miss Lane, all of this and more can be yours if you just give us the information we require. Even the unicorn riding the marshmallow rainbow? Even the unicorn riding the marshmallow rainbow. So Zod approaches Clark's mother dressed as that thing from the opening of Alien and tries to force her to tell him where the Codex is. The Codex is not here. Huh? Hey! That was weird. weird. Extra. Oh no! Where is the Kodak? <laughs> Does this guy have any charm outside of just shouting his ass off? How'd this guy get this position anyway? It's all down to shouting! <laughs> Superman saves his mother, but potentially dooms this entire town by bringing the battle to them. It seems okay for the moment as Zod can't adapt to Earth's atmosphere, but Miss Not Ursa and her masked minions can make up for that. Oh. Damn. 
I'm sorry, yeah. sir. The red, white, and blue pancakes are at Denny's. I appreciate your enthusiasm, though. <laughs> <laughs> and as many people have pointed out, the <laughs> placements in this scene are beyond horrendous, including some painful plugs for IHOP, Sears, 7-Eleven, U-Haul. There's so many ads clashing in this scene, I don't think they could properly plug them all in time. When in town, get a healthy dose of pancakes from IHOP. But, oh wait, when you need a little pick-me-up, grab a slushie from 7-Eleven. I, I mean, when you're looking for clothes for any occasion, Sears is the place for you. Uh, moving soon? Let U-Haul handle all of your services. Oh, now you're not even trying. All right, all right, I'll, I'll give you that one. There is way too much of that in the film. But critic, you have to admit, the action scene is still amazing. What, with countless plugs and people dying left and right? Come on, you know your inner man child can't look past how amazingly awesome the wanton destruction is. Yeah, I can. And of course it's fucking awesome! I know! <laughs> See, certain action set pieces like, like that are pretty cool. Shoot, and the Superman like boom and like smashes him in the mouth. And then they're like going over, it's like Dragon Ball Z, it's just all that shitty stuff is cut out. Well, some of it's just not Dragon Ball Z shitty stuff, new shitty stuff, but this stuff is awesome! Pardon me, but was I hearing enjoyment of this picture? I, I, uh, no, sir. Good. Pussy. No, that's what I'm going to be if I piss him off. <laughs> he finally gets their helmets off. Strange seeing how Zod's came off in one explosion and theirs took like a bajillion. And seeing how he's won, he goes back to his mother to see if she's all right. My suit, son. So sorry. It's only stuff, Clark. Oh, good. Could you tell the people down the street that? Most of my ass and property damages. But Zod discovers the Codex is in Superman's bloodstream and that he doesn't need to be alive in order for them to get it. So it's time to do a little planet redecorating. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, because you've never seen the destruction of a major city in a summer blockbuster before, we give you that thing we just said. With another gigantic floating beam in the sky. Oh, oh the originality! God! All the God. Destroyed, including IHOP, At least Daddy, One Punch Man used giant bullets. Here. Like giant bullet bill sized bullets. I keep, seeing it. I keep seeing these in movies. I mean, <laughs> Jesus Christ, dude. Okay. I'm, I'm not gonna. Oh. Here's all the ingeniously marketed humanity! So, two machines on either side of the world start leveling the planet. This calls for Star Trek style mumbo jumbo mixed in with a simple analogy the audience can understand. The ship is powered by something called a phantom drive. It bends space. Zod's ship uses the same technology, and if we can make the two drives collide with one another, a singularity can be created. Like a black hole. Like putting too much air in a balloon. Of course, it's so simple. So the army goes to take out the one in the city, while Superman goes to take out the one over the Indian Ocean. Now, I know there's a lot of people who get angry saying, Superman should have taken the one in the city first. No, it's not just Superman who saves the world with one direct method. Brave civilians, our military and Superman working together as one. Only he can make it there that fast to the other side of the world. And only he could possibly get around its defenses. Joe, honestly, this setup is so confusing, I'll just take your word for it. No, everybody goes nuts over this, so I'm gonna explain it. What if Superman went for the main one and then they went for the other one there? They may not be able to shut the other one down. Maybe the other one has a, a self-destruct mechanism which would blow up the entire Earth if the first one <laughs> got blown up. So Zod really? to the Earth. <laughs> Apparently, half a lifetime of getting used to this can be reduced down to a couple of seconds now, and grabs the scout ship in order to start rebuilding Krypton. Meanwhile, Lois is on board the military ship about to blast the other one to hell, when something seems to go wrong. There's something wrong. It's not supposed to do this. Well, what's it supposed to do? It's supposed to go in all the way. Damn it, Lois, you had one job that we pointlessly put you in charge of, and that was just to push a button. And you couldn't even do that right! They do eventually get it to work, but Zod is hot on their trail. Target that aircraft. Terminate with extreme disinterest. 
but Superman stops the machine over the Indian Ocean and flies back to destroy Zod on his ship. Zod! If you destroy this ship, you destroy Krypton! The sun's already gone. Krypton had its chance! The bridge between two worlds, everybody! If you have a chance to save a civilization, but... Yeah, they were kind of jerks. Just destroy any chance of them ever coming back. I guess the bridge in this movie is code for either us or them. And honestly, even us kind of got the raw end of it. Are they gone? No. I think so. He saved us. Oh, for God's sake. Could you say that in a part of the city that doesn't look quite so 9 11 for crying out loud, all that's missing is Bush and a banner that says mission accomplished. You know they say it's all downhill after the first kiss. Who the hell says that? Right? But it turns out right? Zod is still alive and angry that wow. his future has been reduced to hot chocolate mix. Bullshit. I exist only to protect Krypton. And every action I take, no matter how violent or how cruel, is for the greater good. Shut up! <laughs> so Zod vows to destroy Superman at any cost. Logically, seeing how he'll chase Superman anywhere, Superman leads him to a location far away from the people so that none of them will ever get hurt, or he once again brings the most dangerous thing in the world to the people he swore to protect. Yeah, I'm sure they're really thankful. Thanks for saving us, Superman. Yeah, imagine the real damage that could have been done if you didn't come to our planet. Oh look, Zod. Oh Jesus, he's gonna save us again! Wait a go, Superman putting us above all else again! Oh God, is that the Statue of Liberty? <laughs> hey, oh what? Oh. <laughs> Superman gets him in a headlock, but Zod vows to make what nice. he supposedly cares for most suffer. Don't do this! Even though there's about three or four different ways those people could probably get out of there. Yeah. Yeah, there's four. There's Run group. forward. Uh, Run yeah. forward. Duck and crawl under. Do something. It's about as dumb as those that kid and that girl standing in the exact same spot in Volcano when the building's coming down. You got a minute and a half. <laughs> you have a minute. God damn it! <laughs> yeah, Tommy Lee Jones! Oh, I'm just gonna run out there and save him! Holy shit! Yeah, yeah. Darwinism, everybody! At work! <laughs> uh. Idiots. Never. Thus, we get our biggest controversial moment in all of the movie Superman breaks Zod's neck. Yes, me. Really? Nothing from you on that one, Joe? Oh. And that's how it saved Christmas with a lightning gun! What was I talking about? The controversial neck-breaking scene. Oh, you know, I'm not gonna lie. When I first saw that scene, I hated it. But the more you really think about it, this is a really bold choice. Because ultimately it lets Zod win. It plays again to a young and inexperienced Clark and how he knows his actions will have huge ramifications. Yeah, it's because having the city nuked didn't have enough ramifications. Point being, it's a catalyst now for why he will never ever take another life. The fact that he had to do it to one of his own people, one of the last remaining Kryptonians. At that moment, he not only chooses to be human, but he makes the ultimate sacrifice for humanity. And he also makes himself forever alone. I agree. Ha! I knew you'd say that. Wait, what? Yeah, surprisingly, the most hated scene by so many fans actually didn't bother me that much. I mean, keep in mind, it would have been less bothersome if they had made it Zod. more. Like, like say those people were trapped under a rock, right? And he was yeah. slowly moving the laser towards their heads. Like that would have made a lot more fucking sense. Yeah. But if they hadn't made it look like there was such a huge area there was. There was a for escape, and, and if the laser wasn't the... moving so slow, you yeah. know, like, yeah. that Cause... was just a horrible directorial decision. Yeah, like, conveyance, yeah, this would work very well if it would, 
if it was if it wasn't so properly. stupid looking. <laughs> oh God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's just Jesus Christ. Some decisions are just baffling to me. But in the second movie, and no one had a heart attack over that. And on top of that, even though it could have been illustrated better, I like the idea they were going for. That you won't always have answers to situations that are always ethically pleasing. It's actually a very difficult, very hard thing to come to grips with. Too bad forgotten in the very next scene. He just blows some more shit up because, like I said, we haven't seen enough of that. Yeah, it's pretty rushed. I mean... He takes down a satellite, and then they make a joke about a how hot he is, and, and they never bring it up again. It's almost like the scene before never freaking happened. It really pisses me the fuck off. They just ruined it right there. They never established that killing people was a big thing for him. Hell, we saw so many other civilians die, I figured that he'd be used to seeing it by now. Um, we never actually see any of those people die as a direct result from Superman. I mean, sure, we see people die when Zod's ship is, is like humping the Earth, but I get what you're saying. You're actually saying we agree on the neck break then. I think so. The one part most fans universally hate, we actually think is okay? For the most part, yeah. So does that mean you actually like it, Critic? Yes. Does that mean you actually like this, Nostalgia Critic? Yeah. Middle of the road. I still think this movie is awful! Oh, come on, man! Huh? No, I'm sorry. I just think it's terrible. There are some things I like. All the actors to play these roles are good choices. The yes. action scenes are awesome. Yes. And though I like the more upbeat Superman, I'm open to the idea of a darker version. But these characters have no identity. Outside of their job and how they look, you wouldn't even know that this was Clark Kent or Lois Lane if they didn't call them Clark Kent or Lois Lane. The millions of subplots are not needed and get in the way of any emotional connection yeah. we want to make. The incoherent storytelling is pointless and annoying, and yeah. as a superhero, he lets way too many people die in this. Even if he took Superman's name off of this, I still wouldn't like this stupid, illogical mess. Well, I think you're totally wrong, Critic. Everything you just said, those characters seem boring to you because they're not as over the top or single noted and as the comic book ones or the Christopher Reeves versions. It's a new kind of Superman that needs a less cliched character, okay? It needs a tougher and darker outlook because we've seen the other Superman stories already. Those are still there. And by putting the in these morally confusing lessons that you call illogical, I see them as challenging. And there's no way to save every single buddy like in previous movies and always get your way. There's just a man struggling between what it means to be human and more than human and trying to do the right thing. Yet he still manages to rise above it and save us all. This movie is awesome. Oh, please, you Houstonians will read too much into anything. Why don't you say that to my fist, hair gel? Oh, look who's talking. That's what I am. They can be a great people they wish to be. They only lack the light to show the way. For this reason, above all, their capacity for good. I have sent them you, my only son. I think I understand now. Joe, I will never like this movie. I think it's an insult to everything Superman stands for, and I will never understand how you could actually like it. Oh, nice. But just because I can't see how doesn't mean I can't understand why. Oh, because I'm a blood-hungry psychopath, right? No! I mean, you are, yeah. but that's not why I think <laughs> you like it. When I see this movie, I see people dying for the sake of getting violent, craving teens in the seats. But that's not what you see. You see one of your favorite superheroes being tested and put through a greater challenge than ever before. And by having him witness and go through so much intensity, it makes his challenges seem greater and his struggle all the more interesting. For you, and probably a lot of the people that enjoy this movie, you're seeing the Man of Steel go up against some of the greatest evil that he's ever gone up against because yeah. of how much damage he does. So when he rises up, you can feel all the more proud of what a terrible thing he stopped. It's not craving dark, horrible things like a maniac. It's seeing someone fight against those dark, horrible things. And not just through him holding heavy stuff, but by standing up for what he feels is important. I don't see the same thing, but at the very least, 
I know that's what you see. So, as long as you're viewing it because you want to see the best of strength and kindness rise up against the worst of oppression and force, all I can say is, go ahead and enjoy it, man. Thanks for understanding. Middle of the road bullshit won't work on me if we're still in! Don't worry, Critic. I'll stop him. Just tell me his location. Hey, how are you doing that? Much better. Now, prepare to die! Prepare organs and what the hell? Hey, Ryan! Right. <laughs> hey, <Rob, laughs> what's up? holes in my ceiling! I'm here to stop you again, Zod. Stay back, Superman, or the Critic's toast! Careful, Zod. You know what I can do. Oh, yeah. But what are you gonna do? Kill me? You break my neck, you'll have message boards all over you like an unemployed writer at Starbucks! So come on, big man, what are you gonna do? You lasered his balls off? Yep. <laughs> but at least I didn't kill him. Dude! But you lasered his balls off! <laughs> I mean, he had it coming, and... I'm surprised he had him to begin with. Jesus. Well, then what'd you do? Uh, you know, the usual. Made sure they got Zod. Oh, my balls. Made out with Lois for a bit. Flew into space. Smiled for the camera. And I bet you were played off to a Hans Zimmer theme. Come on, man. No, 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 no. I swear, they're like exactly the same. I mean, here's my theme. Now here's your theme. It's like a semitone off. Hey, you know, speaking of ripoffs, does this seem at all familiar to you? What do you mean? Like just this whole setup. I feel like I might have seen this before. Yeah. Oh my God! Don't look. What? I said, don't look. You looked, did you? Yes, I did. Did they see you? I don't think. so. Are you sure? Is she absolutely? Don't look. Hi. They're looking right at us. Just keep your eyes down on the table. Hey. Hey. Batman doesn't have a beard. We don't hear that. And we're keeping our eyes down on the table. <laughs> I'm Superman. I'm I think it's awesome that they got that they got. Yes! How should have been? Absolutely. I'm Rob Scallon as well. I mean, he's psychologically tortured. Not special. I've stared into the past and devoid and have come out scarred. Yet responsive. <laughs> that was a pretty good episode of that Nostalgia was, Critic. That was. That was. With a good lesson about how it's kind of okay sometimes to just let people like shit for what they. Well, like yeah. I, I don't. I used to be adamantly against, like, if people had a difference of opinion than me, it was just like, they could burn in hell! Yeah. And now I'm just of the opinion, it's just like, let them be them. Let them do their own thing. I mean, holy shit. Is it really that big of a deal that someone doesn't like the same thing that you like? Is it really that big of a deal... It's just like uh, that one Australian comedian who uh, you said you said uh, he's like he's like oh you're offended well it's a good thing nothing's actually going to happen from you being offended yeah so what if you're offended be offended nothing happens yeah nothing happens at all it's just like if people like don't like the same movies that you like just like Quinn not liking Cowboy Bebop yeah I I was a little shocked but at the same time it's like eh to each their own. You have to be willing to accept the place that I start opinions. to have a problem with stuff is whenever people just because they like something like just start supporting blatantly anti-consumer practices and throwing their money at shit like that. Because yeah. the only way that companies like EA and game design companies like that are ever going to stop the bullshit that they do is if you stop giving them money. Exactly. And if you're just like, no, I don't give a shit. I want to play the Star Wars game really bad. Then all right, like you're going to get your Star Wars game, but it's never going to be any good because you won't fucking stand up for yourself and tell them, no, I'm not going to pay you whenever and, you're going to do bullshit uh, with the game. That's just like your, your friend, your uh, your friend who, uh, when you saw that Battlefront 2 had the microtransactions, you're like, I'm not going to play that. And then you they took them out. 
Yeah, and people in the comments like yelled at me for that because they're like they never put them back in they never put them back in and I was like well they fucking said they were going to put them back in so I mean luckily I guess they didn't keep their word on doing that but they literally were like yeah microtransactions will be back in January and I guess they just didn't put them back in but well it was because the lawsuit came through I guess so there was a lawsuit that was opened up in California over the whole thing and they just decided hey let's not let's not do that anymore oh, yeah Oh, well. But, uh, I don't know, like, sometimes companies are doing things that you have to look at objectively and be like, this is not okay. And whether you like the franchise that they are sitting there doing those things to or not, like, you need to realize that you shouldn't be giving them money to do such horrible anti-consumer practices. Yeah. Uh, for instance, I, oh, Henry Cavill is no longer going to be Superman. He's dropped out of being Superman, pretty much permanently, from what I understand. And I don't know who who I would get to replace him. I mean... I have no idea. I don't know. I really don't know who they could get to replace, to replace Henry Cavill. Yet again, I don't, I don't really... Not I know super, you don't care. Superman enough to really make a decision or a guess on that. I don't know. But I will say this, uh, we, you know what I want? I, this is you're gonna think this is a little off topic and a little crazy, but I want Doctor Who to be played by an American. Why? Because I just want to see what it'll be like. And here's another, and and I've heard people say it would work. Like the Doctor Who is a classic staple of like British sci-fi. Play having an American plane would be absolutely atrocious. It's just like, what about Christian Bale and Henry Cavill? They both played Batman and Superman and actually did pretty good. So why not an American Doctor Who? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I said that argument to somebody one time, and they were just like, "Huh?" And not to mention, uh, fucking uh, what's his name, uh, Spider Man. Oh yeah, Tom Holland. Actually, yeah, Andrew Tom Garfield Holland. before him, and Tom Holland both. They're both, they're both British. And I will say this: Tom Holland is arguably the best Peter Parker and Spider Man. Well, I think he's probably my favorite so far. Uh, yeah, I'd say so too. But I just don't understand why. Like, it, okay. But I mean, obviously, they changed their accents for the roles. Well, yeah, like, they changed their accents, but I at the same time. Doctor Who, although he is a Gallifreyan, you know, from from elsewhere in the universe. Yeah, like he's not from Earth. So yeah. Why does he necessarily have to be British? That's, yeah, actually, they asked that question on the Big Bang Theory because Amy was watching a, an episode with Sheldon, and she was just like, you know, for you know, for a, a, a an alien from a planet called Gallifrey, he sure does have a, a very nice British accent. And then Sheldon's just like, just like, we've had this discussion. We had like, we've had this discussion. Do you want, uh, do you want me to watch? Do you want me to watch this alone? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but anyways, after a fifty-minute nostalgia critic video, which was very good. Yes, very very good. I do need to take a break. Okay, yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this was uh, the nostalgia critics Man of Steel review. If you want to see the original link, is in the description down below. And as always. Until next time, signing off, I'm Nate. I'm Nick. Oh, yeah, and if you're requesting Toonami from Nostalgia Critic in the comments, just know with Nostalgia Critic, we wait a certain amount of time before we do these when it comes out. I yeah. do want to do Toonami, so you don't have to keep asking for it. I know you will anyway, but I'm just letting you know. Eventually, I, just, guys. Just wait for it. Eventually. Plus, I want Micah to be here for that, and Chad. Because... I fucking love Toonami. Toonami is what got me into anime, so of course, of course I want to watch that one. Oh, same here, dude. I'm all aboard. Yeah. All right, well, that's going to do it, everyone. We'll see you in the next one. Peace out.